Okay, welcome to class, everybody. Happy Monday. We're going to start with the demo. So what I have here, if you can see this, this is two plates of ceramic on either side. It's got some wires coming out. And then inside, you have a whole bunch of little metal legs. I don't know if you can see these. They look like little just pieces of metal. But they're stacked up vertically. So you can kind of see through it in certain spots. Um, this is a thermoelectric Peltier cooler. What is that? Anybody familiar with these? Yeah, Isaac. Um, you have two different conductors. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so these, like the name suggests, a thermoelectric, it's going to switch between electricity and heat, right? These can convert between a temperature gradient and an electrical current, right? So how this works is it can operate in two different ways. The first way is you can generate um, a temperature gradient across this device if you provide electrical power. So I've got a 9 volt battery and this thing. I'm going to have Emma hold it. Just sandwich that between your fingers like so. And I'm going to take the positive end, so the smaller end of this, and hook it to the positive cable, and then negative to negative. And what do you feel if the battery's not dead? Don't, Don't feel anything? Not yet. That's concerning. <laughs> Nothing? This side is Okay, this side's cold, cold-ish. This side warmer, I'm hoping. It's starting to get warm. So, and then if I switch the polarity, this battery, it should switch it. What do you feel now? Yeah, so it changes it. What's cool about these is in real time, you saw how quickly, it's essentially instantaneous that this happens, and there's no moving parts in this, right? It's not like a refrigerator in your home where you have to have the whole compressed gases and then they expand and there's this change of heat as they do so. This has no moving parts. It can be cycled on and off as quickly, as rapidly as you want. You could, in fact, they use these things for hot plates. If you have a hot plate that you just want it to get hot, that's easy. That's a stove, right? But if you have a hot plate that you want to set it to a certain value, if you heat it up, it's going to pass that value, and then it has to decay back down. And depending on the temperature you're at, that can take forever. So what we want is something to force the dampening, right? And they use these to do that, right? So you can make it go right to a temperature, so you can provide heat, and then you can pull heat away, so you can dampen it much, much faster. So these are used a lot for actually cooling as opposed to power generation. So anytime you sit down in a, in a BMW or something where it has a fancy cooled seat, the heating could happen with resistive heating. That's joule heating, which we covered last class. But if it's cooling you down, it's one of these. They're not pumping air through the seat or anything or liquid. There's no moving parts on those. It's using thermoelectrics. Now, what I think is really cool about these is that can, they can also operate in reverse. I can take this device. I could set it on this table. The table's colder than my hand. And if I put my hand on the one side of this, there is now a temperature gradient across this device. And if I had a voltmeter, if you touched it to these two wires, you'd see that it is actually generating, there's a voltage across this. I made a tiny little battery out of the waste heat coming off my body between the table and my body, right? So the question is, where would you use these, right? You can use it in two ways. You can either generate a temperature gradient, make one side hot or cold, or you can generate a small power source. Where do you use it? Space. They use them in space. If anybody, anybody read The Martian or saw the movie, he generates heat in his vehicle by taking the radio RTIG, the radioisotope thermoelectric generator. All he does is he takes the, the piece of plutonium that's generating heat, right? And he uses it just for the heat. But those things, because they're constantly generating heat, you could line those with these and you have electricity. And you have electricity that doesn't matter if there's a sandstorm and it blocks the solar cells or anything, because it doesn't use light. It uses heat to generate it. So yeah, Mars rovers, they use these things. Deep space probes, they use them. Because the further, if the sun's over here, as you're moving away from the sun, the flux of energy that you're getting from the sun drops off as I think it's radius to the fourth. I'm pretty sure it's to the fourth. Anyways, you, you kill your, your energy as you move away from the sun. So instead, they put a thermoelectric isotope and they, they generate electricity from those. All right, if you're not going to do it in space, which is a pretty niche application, where might you use these? Yeah. Like in a watch? Yeah. So right now you can buy headlamps where the back side of the headlamp goes against your head, where it's always cold, the outside, or warm, and the other side is colder. That temperature gradient produces a little bit of power. Nowadays, LEDs don't consume a lot of power. You can have a dim headlamp. They're not great, but they're not bad either. Yeah. Garrett? The power pot. Yeah, this came out of our... Today's learning objectives are the following. We're going to introduce this idea of band diagrams because 
you have to understand those to understand all the interesting bits of electronic properties. Last class, we talked to you about just resistivity, conductivity, and that's kind of interesting. We could make a stove, right? You could make those coiled wires, and you could heat it up, and you could do joule heating. But there's many other really interesting properties, from photovoltaics to thermoelectrics to LEDs that all require you to understand band diagrams, OK? We're going to talk about the Fermi level, what on earth is that, and how we can calculate it from the Fermi Dirac distribution. We're going to introduce electron mobility and describe how that relates to the value that we're familiar with, which is electrical conductivity, right? Um, and if we have time, we'll introduce semiconductors and how we can dope them to get the properties that we want out of them. That's probably as far as we'll get. So let's start with just talking about electrical resistivity. Let me remind you that electrical resistivity can be, it can vary enormously, like enormously, more than I think any other property of materials. Think about that, that's pretty amazing. More than anything else, this has the widest range of possible values. You can have extremely good conductors like copper, right? Silver, brass, aluminum, these things conduct. Their resistivity is super, super low, something like 10 to the minus 9, right, ohm, ohm meters. And then you can have on the other end extremely poor conductors, extremely good insulators, right, like foams, rubber, glass. These things don't conduct electricity with beans, right? If you look at this, the range, it goes from negative 9 to positive 15. That's 28 orders of magnitude. That's bananas, right? That's huge. That's billions times billions times billions. Like, that's a crazy amount of variety that we have in materials. So what gives rise to this enormous variety in how electrons are able to or not able to transmit through materials, okay? Metals, by the way, here's some typical values, metals, semiconductors, insulators. They got real creative with the name semiconductor. It kind of conducts, so they went with semiconductor, right? So it all has to do with bands, the bands that form. Here's the best way to understand bands, I think. You start out with a lone atom. Let's start, like, assume helium or whatever, or hydrogen. An individual hydrogen atom, okay? If it's alone, we could say that, that that's our atom. It has some little cloud around it at the electrons, right? And if we were to write the orbitals that those correspond to, it would be the 1s orbitals over here, right? And we could occupy those with, if it's hydrogen, it's got one electron, right? We could put an electron in there, no problem, spin up, okay? Now what's going to happen is as you bring another hydrogen next to it, as you move more and more towards something that looks like an extended solid, your bands start to overlap a little bit. See that these clouds start to overlap? That cloud overlaps with that cloud. These things start to overlap with one another. Electron, if their clouds overlap with one another, then what you're saying is that the electron occupies the same volume, and they cannot occupy the same volume of space at the same energy level, or we violate the Pauli exclusion principle, which we cannot do. So if we can't do that, what do we do? They're, not now, they're no longer at the exact same energy level. They get split a little bit. Now they're at different energy levels, so everything's OK. From quantum mechanics standpoint, we've solved the crisis. And we did that by introducing a little bit of a gap between these. So now let's, talk, let's move away from hydrogen and talk about something that actually forms a solid, like a metal. If this is aluminum and you have a nice extended solid, as you put more and more of these things together, as you have infinite numbers of things together, your gap separation, while it might have been like this really sort of big value up here, it gets smaller and smaller until it becomes a continuous band, right? It's a band. This has some finite thickness in terms of energy. This is some lower bound of energy. Call it zero electron volts, and this goes up to, I don't know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, some value in electron volts. But this is a finite band where all of your electrons now occupy these things just infinitesimally spaced in there. Everybody with me? Yeah, Abby? OK, so this right here represents energy. So if we had two atoms that now overlap a little bit, that's a problem. So th their energy level where they'd like to be is right at the exact same energy, but they cannot because you can't, have energy, you can't have electrons at the same energy level occupying the same space. Otherwise, this is Pauli exclusion principle. Like, th that can't happen. So what we do instead is we give them two different energy levels. The two that used to be here get split, one higher and one lower. And then as you add more and more atoms and it starts to look like a solid, you're essentially adding more and more of these bands. And each one has to be separate from one another. And by the time you have a, an infinite solid, like infinite number of atoms, you'd have an infinitely discrete band where all those, so I don't know, let's say you count up 20 of these things. There's still 20 bands here. It's just that they're so close to one another that it looks like a continuous band. That make sense? 
Can I answer other questions about this? This is pretty important. Everything we do today is going to build on this concept that bands form. Yeah, Andrew? So in all of those diagrams, the average energy amongst electrons is the same? Uh, that's a good question. We're going to talk about the Fermi level in a minute, which tells you what the energy level is of these electrons. So I'm going to pause at that for just a second. Other questions about this? Yeah, Jaden? the energy has to stay the same. What we're going to show you is how is that electrons rarely occupy their lowest energy state. They have temperature, right? For example, they're heated up, and so they're not going to be at their lowest energy state. Some of them are going to occupy higher energy levels, and we need to introduce a different equation to describe that, which we'll get to in just a second. Right now, just understand that bands exist, and then for reasons that we will not get to in this class, you're going to have to take an electronic properties of solids class to get there. If you, like this is your average separation distance, right? Well, sorry, that's not your average. This is what, let's say we start out here. We have atoms that are separated by some distance, right? You have atoms, and they're separated by some distance A. As A gets smaller and smaller together, what you'll see, moving this way, is that bands start to form, right? The point right here where you see them start to split into a band as opposed to a discrete level, that's when they would just start to overlap with one another, right? And then as you keep on getting smaller and smaller, the band's getting bigger because they're overlapping more. But a band gap introduces. These things split, and we won't cover why that is in this class. But a band gap opens up. So that this band is forming, and all of a sudden it opens a gap in the band. Hence, we call it a band gap. So you can put electrons. If this is A0, your equilibrium bond separation distance, which we know how to calculate. We did that all semester long. We can figure out what R0 is. They're calling it A0 here, but it's the equilibrium separation between atoms. This means that you can fill electrons in this material all the way through there. You can put electrons there. But in this gap, you cannot put electrons there. Why can't you? Because there are no states available. There's not an orbital to put an electron at that energy level. They don't exist. OK? It'd be like saying, what's the best way to put it? It's like you took rungs out of the ladder. You can't stand on that rung because somebody took the rung out. Are you with me? You can stand on the lower rungs. Somebody sawed off a couple, so you can't stand there anymore. But then when it's there again, you can stand on that rung of the ladder at a higher energy level. You with me? Any questions so far? Yeah? Um, all materials have this. All solids have that, I should say. Gases, I think, do too. Yeah, all materials have this. And understanding that these band gaps form and then Understanding how your electrons fill these gaps, these, they're not the gaps, the bands, it dictates all the properties that we care about, basically. Pretty much everything is based off of that. Abby? So how does this relate to the experiment you Ah, great question. So, OK, the, the, the Skeletor, we, he was at room temperature. So we could label that his energy, his uh, interatomic separation was right here at A0. That's room temperature for Skeletor. We cooled him off. What did the atoms do? Got closer together or further apart? probably the vast majority of materials get closer together. So we went that way. What did our band gap do? The band gap got larger, probably, right? We're probably down here, where the band gap is now bigger, right? So why does this explain the phenomenon that we saw? At room temperature, when I give Skeletor's button a push right here, we get this nice red color here. Because what you're seeing is you're seeing electrons fall down from here to here. When they fall down in terms of energy, we don't delete that energy. We cannot do that. Instead, you convert that energy to light. And the, en the wavelength of that light will be exactly what this band gap energy is, right? The photon that comes off has an energy. It's going to be exactly equal to this difference from this upper band to the lower band. OK? You all with me? Now, when I move to colder temperatures, this now is a bigger difference in energy. Agreed? So what color shift should we see? Let's pull up our, our spectrum. We went from red. We should be going to higher energy. So what, what is higher energy? If we look at this thing, we were over here at red, some wavelength. 
As we move towards blue, we're going from the IR end of the spectrum towards the UV. IR is lower energy than UV because the wavelength is getting shorter, it's higher energy. We're dropping from a bigger difference in energy that w the photons coming off have more energy and they change color because you can see that difference. Nobody's mind's blown by this? That's pretty amazing. We saw a difference in energy with a Skeletor toy and a bunch of liquid nitrogen, which is amazing, right? That's what we see, right? If we heated this thing up, what would you expect to see? If instead of putting it in liquid nitrogen, I put it in a furnace for a while, not too hot, right? What would we see? We'd see it shift, the average separation distance gets bigger, and so this would shift that way. If we were red before, what might happen? You might not see it anymore. It might switch over to the IR, and our eyeballs can't see in the IR, right? It might look like it died, but in fact, it's just emitting a light that we can't see. Yeah, Andrew? What happens if we heat it off so that there's no longer that gap in there? Do we exit after uh, What would happen there? Uh, we have to talk about PN junctions first before we can answer that, and we probably won't get that today. That'll be next class. Okay. On Wednesday, we can answer that question. Carlos? And then if you look at the graph, it kind of looks like it kind of comes together and then on the bottom. Oh, like they're joining here again? I don't know if that's actually true or not. I didn't make this graph. I took it from the interwebs, and I don't know if they do that or not. I'd have to, and it might even be material dependent. I don't know. Any questions about the band gap? A, a, Right now, you're just going to take for granted that gaps exist in the available energy levels where you can put electrons. We also see that you can move from these different levels. Like with the Skeletor thing, I told you that you can go from a higher level down to this lower level. You can also go the other way. You, if you're an electron that lives down here and you get enough energy, you can jump up and you can live up there. It might be temporary. You might jump back down later. But transitions between these gaps are possible. What you cannot do is occupy a space in here because there is no space to occupy. There is not an energy level you can park your car at there. Okay? Everybody with me? Let's keep going. Okay? So these band gaps actually turn out to be the exact reason why we have this huge 28 orders of magnitude difference in properties, right? Some materials um, have a continuous band, and your electrons that you have in your material fill right up to somewhere in the middle of this band. Now you'll notice there's different colors. It's like pink kind of red and dark red. This represents that electrons don't like fill up to a certain point in a bucket. Like water fills up a bucket and it's like at a certain level. But that's because water can't be excited easily by thermal energy, but electrons can. So this is totally filled, this is partially filled, this is even less partially filled, and this is no electrons, right? So electrons, because they have some energy from heat, for example, they can jump up temporarily to higher states and this is sort of in flux, this region in between. The point though, this would be a metal because at all different energies, those electrons are occupying a partially filled band. We use that terminology, partially filled band. If this band was filled right up to the top, then it's like a bus where all the seats have a person in it. And again, think of the person moving on a bus. If you sit down in a seat and then you want to scoot your way to the back of the bus by hopping from seat to seat, but every seat's filled, you can't hop from seat to seat because everything's filled. That's not going to be a good conductor. But if the bus is half empty, then you could hop from seat to seat to the back of the bus. That's what you have here in a metal. It's a partially filled band, which makes it a pretty good conductor. Okay? Not only do you have carriers, you have electrons that are free electrons. That means that they're not tied up in bonding, so they're able to sort of swoosh around at, at will. But they have spots that they can jump to because you have a partially filled band. Any questions so far? Yeah, Jaden? Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what happens to insulators. A material that you would never think conducts electricity, if you heat it up enough, almost everything conducts electricity. Like zirconia, alumina, these things that we use because they're insulators become awesome conductors at crazy temperatures. Okay? So let's take an insulator like alumina. Why does alumina not conduct electricity? Because its electrons fill this lower band, which we call the valence band. VB equals valence band, right? Up above, you have the conduction band is the terminology, okay? And this gap is so big in terms of energy that none of your electrons, which have some amount of thermal energy, none of them are able to jump across this gap, okay? Since they can't jump across the gap, 
This is like a bus with a bunch of seats filled, not useful for you. This is a bus with a bunch of empty seats, but no people on it, right? So neither of these, this can't conduct electricity, right? And then semiconductors are kind of in the middle, right? They have a gap, but it's a small gap. It's a small enough gap that the little bit of thermal energy that your electrons might have is enough for them to get promoted across the band gap, where now it's like you've got a few people in a mostly empty bus, so they can move from the front to the back really easily. So this is seriously like a double-decker bus. Picture like in England, a double-decker bus, like in your mind's eye. You've got the bottom level, which people are lazy, so they don't want to climb up the stairs. They're going to fill the bottom level, right? And then if you give them a little bit of energy and they really don't want to be together, then some of them will pay the energy price to climb up stairs where they can now move from the front to the back at will, right? Carlos? Uh, will these also conduct? So if you got a conductor and you ran through a really low temperature, will I see. I see. No. Not, 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 no, no, I don't think so. What instead is going to happen is picture like a green energy level here. The green line represents, if you were to cool this thing down to absolute zero, cool it way, way down, take away all the thermal energy from your electrons, that's where it would fill up to. This one would like to fill up to right in the middle of the gap. But there's no seats there. So instead it just fills this completely and this, nothing, at zero Kelvin. This thing at zero Kelvin, it would fill up completely to right here, and then nothing. So as you add more and more energy, what you're seeing is that this sort of like up and down ability to occupy additional states, that just gets bigger. So if this is like at, at one temperature, and then you heat it up more, it might be even more like that. But you still have empty, partially filled bands, so it's still gonna conduct. Whereas over here, like, if this thing starts to occupy even more, well, I guess I should draw it relative to the Fermi level. They start to occupy everything in this band, partially, right? Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Does the size of the band also affect the temperature? The size of the band uh, would also be affected by temperature change. You're right, because we just saw that. As you cooled it down, our band got bigger, right? With, with the demo with the laser, well, Skeletor that we just showed you. Yeah, the band also changes a little bit. These are good questions. Keep going. OK, band gaps exist. Um, there's this idea of the Fermi energy. The Fermi energy is the green line that I drew. It represents where they would fill if it was at zero Kelvin. If you took away all the thermal energy, now it's just like putting marbles in a bucket. They're just going to stay put wherever their highest level is at. That's the Fermi level. Okay. Um, we've talked about how this leads to different types of materials. Here's a, here's a depiction of the Fermi level. So they've switched the axes on us. Now they're plotting electric, electron energy on the x-axis. So higher energy is now to the right instead of up and down. And, and on the vertical axis, they're showing you the probability of occupancy, right? So as you go from low energies using the Fermi-Dirac distribution, named after Fermi, like Enrico Fermi, famous dude, and Dirac, another famous dude, right? As you're at low energies, your probability of occupying these states is basically 100%. It's one. That's your fraction of, of occup occupancy. But if this was your Fermi level, at, which you can see at zero Kelvin, it's a hard line here. As you move to higher and higher temperatures, you start getting some sort of smeared out distributions. The higher you go, the more smearing you get. Everybody with me? So there's a mathematical expression that can calculate exactly what that smearing looks like. It's called the Fermi-Dirac equation. Okay? I don't think we actually show it here. Okay? And again, I think we've said this a couple times, that if this is the top of your valence band, ignore this gray region for a minute, and that's your conduction band, electrons need to get across that gap to conduct. At low temperatures, you don't have enough. If this is your occupancy, it's 100% occupying your valence band, and then it's zero at this point. Heat it up a little bit, and you lose some of your occupancy down here. You might start to have empty seats in the valence band. Like this part of the bus has empty seats, and those people moved upstairs to the conduction band. So you start getting conduction both in the conduction band as well as in the valence band, because you put empty seats here. Everybody with me? Yeah, Chase? And uh, how low temperatures can we actually verify that smear for, like, in practice? Uh, how low of temperatures? Yeah, how low of temperatures? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I, I'm sure people have investigated that. I have never actually given that any thought before. But it's, it's pretty um, easily measured. You could look at... Uh, for example, you could do, um, uh, what do they call these? Um, when you strip away electrons, what do they call that? Um, 
I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the word for it. There's an experiment where you can, rip, you can figure out what the energy is to rip away your most highest energy electron. And as you change the, the energy or material, you can see that that difference changes. Uh, I'm totally blanking on the word. Ionization energy. Yeah, as you pull it away to vacuum. You can measure the ionization energy, and it would change as a function of temperature for sure. Okay? Yeah, Jaden? We're going to in a minute. It's super useful. Um, hold that thought. We're going to come back to it, okay? Um, so we can go across it. We can go up, down. Um, let's see. What else we want to say about these? I'm going to skip that. Okay, let's talk about mobility for a minute. Electron mobility is a measure that you can think of sort of like what's the friction that electrons experience as they move through material. So to, to set this question up, let's do this clicker question. We have this clicker question, which asks the following. If you have an electric field, which we learned last class, an electric field is the driving force why a charged particle moves in, through a material, right? If it's heat moving through a material, the driving force was a difference in temperature. If it's diffusion, then the driving force was a difference in concentration. Here we're saying it's an electric field. There's a difference in potential from one side to the other. So the question is, OK, if your electric field is uniform, you take a 9-volt battery and you clip it to either end, so you've got a nice uniform field across your sample, then the charge carriers, whether they be electrons, holes, or ions, we'll talk about what those last two mean, they're going to continuously accelerate while within the field. Right? The field's what makes them start to accelerate. Will they keep on accelerating until they hit the end of the electric field? No, it's, this isn't a material. I've got like an iron wire. I clip a battery on two points on it. That's going to make the electrons start to move from one side to the other. Do they keep on accelerating all the way across? Yay or nay? OK, get your answers in. OK, I'm going to close the poll. OK, people think true or false. People think f mostly true. So. It will actually not continuously accelerate. It's false. Now, the reason why is the same reason why if I jump out of an airplane, my body is now experiencing a force on it. It has a net force because of gravity, right? There's a gravitational force acting on my body as I jump out of an airplane. So I'm going to accelerate at, towards the Earth, but I don't continuously accelerate. Instead, what happens? Yeah. Right. You, you don't, <laughs> so it depends on how long the wire is. All right, I'll give you credit on that. That's a fair answer. I will make either one correct. You. You, will, you will accelerate <laughs> until you hit terminal velocity. Turns out that's a very short distance in a wire, but yeah, I'll give that to you. In an airplane, I, c I don't know how long until you hit terminal velocity, but at some point, you don't go any faster than, I don't know, a couple hundred miles an hour or something, probably. And then why don't you speed up anymore? Yeah, because you reach an equilibrium. The gravitational force telling you to accelerate is offset by the drag force, which says slow down, right? There's a resistance. Turns out electrons and electrical carriers in a material also have a drag that they experience. And it's easiest to think about this in terms of mobility. So if you have a material, here's a simulation. They applied an electric field across this material, and it, they applied a couple different values for the mobility. In one case, it travels, you can see that it's sort of like jerking all over the place because it's undergoing scattering events. It might be colliding with an atom or something, and it's getting slightly scattered. And so instead of just traveling straight across it, it's sort of ping pong balling its way around. So this is with a fairly long scattering distance. This is a much shorter scattering distance, it's more like a little tight scribble. Here's a really long scattering distance where it basically doesn't scatter from the matrix. It only scatters from these secondary phase precipitates. And then here's one where I don't know what the difference is. Okay? 
you could quantify the degree to which electrons are resisting passing through a material. And the inverse of that will be its mobility, right? How mobile is it as it traverses through a material? So the electron mobility turns out to be an important term. It allows us to calculate the terminal velocity. We call it the drift velocity, right? Drift velocity, V sub d, that's the maximum literal velocity that electrons will move through your material at. It's going to be equal to your mobility. That's mu sub e. So that's the mobility of an electron. That's what the sub e is. The mobility of your electron times the electric field. If you multiply those two terms together, you get your drift velocity. Okay. If you multiply uh, the number of carriers that you have times their charge times the mobility, you get the conductivity, the electrical conductivity. So why do some materials have really, really low electrical conductivity and some have really, really high conductivity values? It could be a couple reasons. It might be that one material has way better mobility than another material, right? Copper has really long paths between collision events. So it's a great conductor. It has really good mobility, right? Another material might be a really good conductor because it has loads of free electrons, N. That's your electron concentration. So it... So just because something has a really high conductivity, it doesn't mean that it has lots of electrons or lots of mobility. It means that this term altogether is high. But it could be coming from either of these two things. The charge of the electron is not changing. But it could be a high mobility, a high, a high carrier concentration, or both. OK? Everybody with me? OK. Um, so you can introduce things that will, again, if we take one over this value, that's the resistivity. If you take one over that. And you can add things that will cause your electron mobility to go down. So adding dopants, for example. Remember with sterling silver? Sterling silver, we added a little bit of copper, and that strengthened it, which was good, because then it doesn't scratch as easy. But it, do you think it would be a better or a worse conductor? It's going to be worse. Because you put a bunch of copper atoms in there, those don't look like the silver matrix. Those are going to be spots where an electron is going to get scattered, maybe. right? So what we see is something called Matthiessen's law, where, or Matthiessen's rule where here's your resistivity. Plotting it as a function of temperature, we, th we see that resistivity goes up with temperature. Things resist electron motion if they're metals more as you heat them up. Why? Why should they resist more as you heat them up? Well, think about you guys. At, at low temperatures, your feet are holding perfectly still. There's no atomic vibration. So if I was going to try and like roll a tennis ball up the row, it's going to go, I don't know, some distance before bonking into a foot or a chair leg or something. Now imagine that you're doing like this with your feet because you're at a higher temperature. The odds of it colliding with an atom just got a lot higher. So your resistivity got higher, right? And that's what you see. As you, if it's a metal, as you go up in temperature to the right, your resistivity rises. Now this is pure copper, and then this is copper with increasing dopants. As you increase impurities, dopants, you're going to make it more resistive. It's going to be a worse and worse conductor. So the very best conductor, if you really want to buy something that's the best on the market, it's HO, what's it called? Do I have it here? Oh, Oxygen-free high-conductivity copper, OFHC. They've basically purified copper and gotten rid of all the metal impurities, and they've gotten rid of all the oxygen that might be in that material. And by making it as clean and perfect as possible, you get the best conductor, basically, that you can buy. Electricity, right? Okay? So Matthiessen's rule essentially says the total resistivity is equal to that from thermal plus impurities plus dislocations plus other terms. They just add linearly. Okay? That's Matthiessen's rule. Um, and again, you can see that. Here's electrical resistivity on the y-axis plotted against composition. As you go from pure to not pure, it's just this. In this case, it has a linear rise, and then it sort of plateaus. Right? Why should it plateau? Well, think where it reaches. It reaches 50%. What do you think it does on the other side? It starts to go back down again. It might not go to the same value because this is nickel and something unlabeled, right? So they might not have the same value. But when it gets to 50%, that's your maximum disorder. So after that, you start to get better as you go down on the other side, OK? Um, aluminum turns out to be a really great material for conductivity. And we talked about last time that this used to be what they wired electricity in homes with because it's cheaper. Its conductivity is about half that of copper, which is unfortunate. But its cost is like $3 a pound, whereas, sorry, it's a dollar a pound, whereas copper is three. So it's like a, it's three times less. So the economics make sense here. You could just do more aluminum 
The problem is there's something called electromigration, and it's more prone to corrosion. Um, and so th that's really the reason why they don't use it, because from a conductivity versus cost standpoint, it should be a better material. But there's other things that make, that make it worse. OK, let's talk about semiconductors for a minute. Semiconductors, um, there's something called intrinsic versus extrinsic semiconductors. What's the difference? Intrinsic semiconductors have not been doped. We haven't added anything to them. An extrinsic semiconductor, you've doped it. So for example, pure silicon, 100% pure silicon would be an intrinsic semiconductor. If you take silicon and you add things to it to change its electronic properties, you've now made an extrinsic semiconductor. These materials have a band gap because they're not metals, so they have a band gap. And the value just depends, right? Silicon, for example, has a band gap of 1.1 electron volts. That's on the smaller side, right? You can have, say, cadmium telluride or gallium arsenide. These have much larger values, OK? As the ionic character of the bond gets larger, how do we determine ionic character again? We saw this in the very first chapter. Basically, it has to do with the difference in the electronegativity. As that difference gets larger and larger, your band gap gets larger. So again, if we took a look at a periodic table here for a minute. Um, silicon is right in the middle at, at 4, right? It's, uh, it's got 1, 2, 3, 4. So it has a half-filled band. So you're like, oh, this should be a metal. It has a half-filled band. But that's not how si silicon forms. It bonds with other things because it wants to complete its band. It forms covalent bonds. So each silicon is bonded to four other silicons. They all share their electrons and it actually forms a filled band. Okay? I'll show you in a moment. So that's silicon right here. But you could also have gallium arsenide. We call this a 3-5 semiconductor because it takes a column 3 and a column 5. We don't count these columns as the transition metals. This is column 1, column 2. We jump over here. This is 3 and 5. Okay? So silicon would be a column 4 semiconductor. You can also have 3, 5. And then strangely, you can have things like 2, 6. Like now they call this 2. I didn't make the rule. Zinc over here, they call it 2. And you've got like antimony or sulfur. Like zinc sulfide would be a 2, 6 semiconductor. What it's really doing is it's saying it's got 2 electrons plus 6. Those add up to 8. You can have three electrons plus five, those add up to eight. Four and four add up to eight. You're still filling this rule, but as you go from silicon to gallium arsenide to zinc sulfide, you're becoming more and more ionic and less and less covalent, and so the band gap is getting bigger. Okay? Chase. So how far across those transition metals can you actually go? Two six is like as far as you ever see. There might be other ones that people do, and I just don't know of it, but three, five, and two, six are the, are the common ones that you'll hear people talk about. Okay, so group four, group three, five, group two and six, and there's some examples shown here, okay? So here's what's happening. You've got your pure silicon lattice, and we said for a minute that each silicon, if we count the number of electrons they have, they each have four. So one, two, three, four, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and we could keep on going. And you, you see that the reason this thing forms covalent bonds is so that they share. Right? They share their electrons, and by sharing, every silicon now has eight electrons, and it's happy. Right? Any given silicon, like this guy in the middle, it has eight electrons around it, so it's happy. That's why silicon forms four bonds. Right? It does sp3 hybrid, hybridization of its orbitals to form four bonds, and that way it ends up with its eight electrons, and it's totally happy. This would look like, in terms of band diagram, it would look like this. You've got your valence band your conduction band, and this would be totally filled, and up above would not be filled at all. This thing, we took all of our electrons, we filled it by filling this perfectly, we completely occupied the valence band, and we don't have any in the conduction band. So this is not conducting. It's not a conductor, unless you start to heat it up enough where things can jump across that gap, right? So what does that look like in this picture? When you heat it up, what does that look like? When you start to put electrons jumping across this gap, right, as they jump up here, and occupy this site, they create a hole down here. That's just a spot where an electron used to be, so we call it a hole, an electron hole, right? So literally what we're doing is we're taking one of these electrons, we're getting rid of it, we're putting a hole here, and that electron is now just like chilling, right? It's, it's free to move through the lattice, right? Because as it gets close to this silicon, this silicon's like, I don't need a ninth electron, I'm already happy with eight. This one doesn't want it. If anything, 
that it wants to recombine and go back to that vacancy. That is when you go from an upper energy level and you fall back down and you refill that hole is when this thing finds its way back to where it came from. Everybody with me? Are there any questions? Yeah, Andrew? Why doesn't it do that the moment it gets dislodged from that hole? Um, it, it, it's a good, good question. When it hops away, it now is going to, it has thermal energy. So it's moving sort of at random. And it does experience a slight, because if we were to draw the charges on this, this thing is negatively charged. And the hole that it left behind is positively charged. So there is a Coulombic interaction between those two that says, go back home, right? It, it does experience that. Um, it's called an ionization uh, uh, field that it has here. So it will experience that. Now, why, why in practice does this not happen? Is because you have an electric field across this thing, right? You're using this in a device where you, you know, hooked up a, a current across this thing, an electric field across this thing to produce a current. So you put a battery across this, so it's got an electric field, and that's a big electric field. So this negative charge is going to experience that electric field, and it's going to move in response to it. And it's going to move away from where it started. Okay? If there's a bunch of those, they might recombine along the way, right? So these, ha these do have what we call a carrier lifetime, which is how long is it separated like this. And so if you take an electronics class, you'll learn more about that. But that's the idea, is that it will be temporarily away from that. And if there's an electric field, it will get, it'll move. It'll, you've created a current through your material. Jaden? Yeah. Right, so this is your silicon. If you, hook, if you put a current across it, and you have some temperature where this happened on its own, then however many of these things happened on its own are now free to move in response to the electric field. That is intrinsic conductivity. If you heat this thing up more, you might see more of these vacancies happening. So your carrier concentration went up, right? If we go back to our expression here, heating it up, we get our carrier concentration to go up. And assuming that doesn't mess with our mobility too bad, which it will, it's going to cause this to go down a little bit, but this goes up a lot then you have a net increase in your conductivity. So this is the exact opposite of metals. Metals, what did we say? We said in metals, where was it? Metals was right here. As you heat metals up, their resistivity increases. Semiconductors and, semi and insulators are the exact opposite. As you heat them up, their resistivity goes down because the conductivity is equal to the number of carriers times the charge of those electrons times their mobility. This went way up, and this just went a little bit down. So overall, you see an increase in the conductivity of insulators and semiconductors, while in metals, you see the other trend. And this turns out to be a really good way to figure out what you have. You measure its resistivity, and you do it as a function of temperature, and you say, oh, this is a traditional metal. It must not have a band gap, whereas the other one must have a band gap because it's getting better when I heat it up. Okay? So how does this change for an extrinsic semiconductor? This will be the last thing we cover today. An extrinsic semiconductor has been doped with another atom that messes up our math here. Let's say we put a phosphorus in here, right? So instead of having silicon here, we're going to put phosphorus, OK? If we put phosphorus there, how many electrons does phosphorus have? Well, silicon's here, and it had four. Phosphorus has five electrons. So if we did all of our same drawings as before, we've got all these electrons filling up all these orbitals. Right? But then you've got this extra one from phosphorus, this extra electron. How badly do you think it wants to hang on to that extra electron? Not very badly. That's electron number nine. It would be much happier if that electron just beat it and it was able to get rid of it. So that's exactly what happens. You end up with a vacancy of that electron, a hole, and that electron is now able to move to the lattice and go about doing electron things. Okay. And the point is, the, the way that this is different than regular silicon, regular silicon, to rip out one of these electrons from a bond costs a lot of energy. Ripping this guy away does not cost very much energy. So we'll pick up here next time. <laughs>